He earned his PhD at University College London. His postdoc position at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston involved techniques to produce topographic maps of Io and Saturn's <coughs> mid-sized icy moons. As a NASA postdoctoral fellow at NASA Ames, he used the Mars Sim landform evolution model to investigate the Galilean moon Callisto. He's also an affiliate of the geological and geophysical investigation team of NASA's New Horizons mission. Also as a SETI research scientist, he investigated Pluto's distinctive terrain and participated in New Horizons operations and post-flyby data analysis. And I think as we look at these images, we might be reminded of Brian Day's photograph, I mean, talk, sorry, a few months ago when he discussed NASA treks and how flybys are observing these terrains of these wonderful icy worlds. And you can take virtual treks now, if not now, certainly in the future. So it's a nice tie in, I think. And join me in welcoming Oliver White. Ooh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Linda, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, the original person who was supposed to uh, present, uh, my colleague at SETI, the SETI Institute, and that's at Ames, uh, Orkanu Mahan, sends his apologies. He was way late at a late stage, so I'm, uh, I'll be filling in for him. Uh, but um, I am also a researcher in planetary science, uh, Linda, um, yeah, I've just described uh, sort of my uh, background. Um, so this uh, talk I'm going to uh, give to you uh, tonight was um, actually created by Bob Papalado at uh, JPL, who is the uh, project scientist for the Europa Clipper mission uh, coming uh, next day, <coughs> decade. It's what he one he uses for his sort of outreach uh, purposes on Europa and the Europa Clipper. Um, I made a few late stage modifications uh, to it. Um, for instance, uh, this one here to acknowledge the uh, acknowledge the season. <laughs> so this talk is uh, really just about um, Europa, one of the most uh, fascinating objects uh, in the uh, solar system. Um, sort of the geology that um, has been shown to us by uh, the Galileo uh, mission and uh, how our best efforts at the moment to explain uh, this geology and uh, what the Europa Clipper mission has in store, what um, extra stuff that should uh, teach us about this fascinating object. Um, let's see. So um, also one uh, sort of quick disclaimer, apologies if some of the text in this uh, presentation appears a little small. I think Bob's uh, presentation philosophy and mine are a little different. Um, probably some of the text could have been a bit bigger, but there isn't that much, so it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be too bad, and I'll be explaining it anyway. So this was our original view of uh, Jupiter's um, sort of Galilean uh, system, was drawn by Galileo himself back in the early uh, 17th, uh, early 17th century, and um, this is uh, how we uh, see them today, the amazing images sent back by um, NASA's Galileo spacecraft that orbited Jupiter between uh, 1995 and 2003. It's, it's amazingly diverse uh, range of about, uh, of, 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 a diverse range of four worlds, um, and uh, Europa is the uh, smallest uh, of these, and uh, here are some uh, stats here to go off to its size. So it's about well, about a quarter of the Earth's uh, diameter, about 90% of the Moon's, um, it's just under a sixth of the Earth's uh, gravity, and uh, about uh, 30 million uh, kilometers uh, squared of uh, real estate, about 6% of, uh, of Earth's. Um, I'll talk about these landscapes in more detail in uh, coming slides, but um, uh, it has a very a pretty unique uh, surface, um, Europa, but really only of quite a small uh, range of land, different sort of landforms, certainly compared to somewhere that's sort of like a geological theme park like uh, Pluto. So it has really a unique surface, but um, sort of, yes, quite a small range of uh, landforms that actually uh, crop up, um, most notably these uh, ridged plains here. There are a few craters around, and also these other peculiar sort of areas called Chaos uh, and Lenticuli. Now, um, uh, Europa is uh, sort of distinguished by the fact that it's um, uh, the, pretty much the smoothest object um, in the solar system on a global scale. Its total topographic relief um, that we know of, we don't have a global topographic map yet of uh, Europa, but um, from what the images that have been sent back thus far, we think its topographic relief, pro relief probably doesn't extend beyond a few kilometers. Uh, for most parts, it's just hundreds of meters. Compare that for Earth, where it's about 20 kilometers uh, from the Marianas Trench to uh, 
Mount Everest, so extremely, it's like an, sort of like an eggshell uh, on a global scale, but as we'll see close up, it's much rougher on a small scale. It's also, um, it has a uh, basically a water ice um, crust that makes it also one of the brightest objects in the solar system. I think uh, it's certainly vying with Enceladus, uh, the small moon around uh, Saturn, for a sort of dazzle, dazzle effect. So, um, as I'll um, mention uh, in future slides, um, the, we think that the landforms of uh, Europa all point to it having a uh, sort of a subsurface ocean. Um, basically, its icy crust that um, covers it is melted at depth to form a global ocean. Um, so, another uh, way in which we think uh, it's, it, uh, it, there's, a, that there's a subsurface ocean present is that uh, the Galileo orbiter found that um, uh, Jupiter's magnetic field has actually induced uh, a magnetic field in uh, Europa itself. And this can only be really explained if there's an, a mobile conducting layer under its surface. And uh, given its icy nature, we think that this will be due to a, um, a sort of mobile subsurface ocean that is also salty. This sort of brininess is the uh, crucial factor for explaining sort of why it would be uh, conducting. Um, so this is sort of the current picture of what we think its interior uh, would look like. So um, it's sort of we think uh, it's I think it's differentiated. That is, it's sort of its rocky element has sort of settled into an iron metallic core when it's sort of molten, <laughs> sort of soon after its formation, surrounded by a sort of silicate rocky uh, sort of mantle. And then uh, once we get up here to the uh, get the um, ocean, what we think is about a hundred uh, kilometers deep, and, and co it's uh, covered by a br sort of more brittle icy shell, ten to uh, thirty uh, kilometers uh, thick up at the surface. So um, why would there be an ocean at all? So this is ultimately um, down to uh, this sort of how uh, Europa is heated. Um, there is probably some heat coming out from decay of radio, radioactive uh, elements in its interior, but um, certainly there's no way that it, uh, sort of that heat by four and a half billion years after it formed would be enough to sort of maintain a, um, a uh, sort of liquid water ocean. So there must be some other um, uh, sort, of sort of origin of the heating uh, that can sort of consistently uh, sort of uh, keep an ocean Warm. And we think that um, the uh, main contributor to um, sort of keep to heating all of the Galilean satellites is a tidal uh, flexing. So this can work in a couple of ways. One is that um, Europa's orbit is not actually quite uh, circular, it's slightly elliptical. And uh, so basically, um, the gravity, uh, it's sort of gravitational sort of, uh, sort of force of, of, from Jupiter on uh, Europa sort of changes at different points in its orbit. Um, when it's farthest away from uh, Jupiter, it sort of settles most into a spherical shape, but when it's uh, getting it's comparatively near to Jupiter, um, it um, sort of gets slightly sort of tugged and elongated, and this creates stress in its interior that um, likewise creates uh, tidal, uh, tidal heating. But um, there's also um, the additional factor of that um, uh, the innermost uh, Galilean satellites, uh, Io, Europa, and Ganymede, are in orbital resonances. So uh, that for every uh, four orbits that Io makes, um, uh, Europa makes two and Ganymede makes uh, one. And it's this regular um, pushing and pulling uh, in this, uh, uh, between the moons, as well as the effect of Jupiter, um, that uh, really um, has the effect of uh, heating up their interiors. And, the interiors of these bodies are heated to different degrees by tidal effects, uh, sort of depending on how close you are. So, in the case of Io, um, its tidal heating is so extreme that it has no ice left on its surface at all. It's the most volcanically ob uh, active object we know of in the uh, solar system. It has a constant volcanic activity that spews out these sulfurous compounds. Um, Europa is slightly farther out, so it doesn't. It hasn't had sufficient heating to sort of boil away its icy layer, but it is sufficient to create this uh, sort of subsurface ocean and this uh, this crust that uh, sort of uh, shows in many ways the presence of a subsurface ocean. And then things get weaker as you go out. Ganymede shows some evidence of resurfacing, surfacing, whereas Callisto is kind of um, sort of a control. Uh, sort of moon for the others. It's basically just remained a crater ball since it formed uh, four and a half billion years ago. There's been no real interior heating that has changed its surface. It's just been pe uh, peppered by uh, impact since then, and they're all recorded there on the surface. And uh, it's also worth noting down here that um, these moons are all tidally locked to Jupiter, so gradually um, over time, uh, these moons, their rotation slowly 
changes. So they would have formed with one sort of rotation period, but uh, over time they gradually uh, change um, to basically match their orbital period. So that means that like Earth's moon, they're always there. They always present the same face uh, to Jupiter, what we call tidally locked. Now, with a 100 kilometer deep uh, ocean, that actually means that Europa would have more liquid water than Earth does. This is where sort of if you took all Earth's water and clumped it up into a bore, uh, that's uh, how big it would be. But this is how big uh, Europa's, uh, we think, uh, would, would be uh, there. So it's uh, quite a substantial uh, amount. And of course, um, as I'll get on to later, there's all sorts of uh, implications here for uh, life. We know there's life on Earth, Mars, uh, no liquid water really at the moment, we don't think, and any appreciable uh, quantities, certainly not lasting for a very long surface if it existed. But, um, possible past conditions for life, and so big question mark on uh, for, over Europa, if there is a big liquid ocean under its ice and crust, then could that potentially um, have a, sort of, uh, been a um, sort of bed for the genesis of uh, life, life 2.0. So um, now we'll get on to um, the uh, sort of various uh, geological features we see on uh, Europa um, and sort of how each we think indicates the uh, subsurface ocean. So the most ubiquitous are these ridges, which we call lineae, that crisscross the surface. It's like a sort of a ridge fractal on Europa. They occur sort of many different, um, sort of all, di all different uh, sizes. This is a comparatively simple one. It's uh, basically two sort of ridges with a um, sort of a central trough that um, that they bound. And uh, what we think um, is forming all these ridges is basically the tidal forces uh, that uh, Europa is um, uh, exerted on uh, Europa. Basically, crack um, its brittle uh, outer shell, um, icy outer shell. Um, here, let's uh, clean that and play it again. If it, uh, do it. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the idea is that um, uh, the uh, the icy shell that covers the ocean is brittle, um, uh, sort of close to the surface, but it's sort of more ductile um, further down, where it's warmer. And the idea is that uh, sort of as the um, sort of brittle crust is fractured um, by the tidal forces, some of this uh, ductile ice, which is sort of a warmer and less dense, actually um, uh, sort of percolates. Well, it sort of forces its way up sort of into these uh, cracks and sort of extrudes on the surface. And the closest analog on Earth to that is the mid-ocean Atlantic, uh, well, the, yeah, the mid-ocean ridges that occur in seas all across um, uh, the Earth, where instead you have silicate magma that's uh, pushing up and spreading uh, outwards. And you can also see, in, uh, you might have noticed in uh, some of this um, uh, video, the, um, uh, let's go there. From here, but anyway, um, the, if we get in close, you can see the uh, this uh, sort of material of this ridge seems to superpose some of the ridges underneath it. This particular one is presumably quite young because it, uh, it yeah superposes every other ridge that it uh, comes in contact with, and you can see some of its material sort of seems to overlay uh, some of this uh, material down here. So um, let's see. Okay. So I think this uh, image conveys quite well just the sort of uh, total labyrinthine uh, nature of um, these uh, sort of these ridges uh, on Europa. And um, one thing that's been noted is that uh, sort of you can maybe able to see up here. There's often quite what looks like uh, there's been strike slip action on uh, these uh, sort of acting across uh, these uh, ridges. So it's basically. This used to be sort of a hole and it fractured and uh, there was a sort of motion, dextral motion here. This part up here moved to the right, this down, part down here moved to the left at the same time as material was coming up through the crack and extruding. Some of these uh, linear, what I showed you was quite a simple one, like sort of these uh, narrow ones here. But these things can get up to sort of a few tens of kilometers wide and they can actually form these sort of broad sort of what like striated bands where maybe uh, perhaps they're more advanced. Um, stages of uh, spreading uh, here. Um, uh, and also I thought I'd throw this uh, image in as well, because um, this is the highest resolution image that Galileo returned of Europa. It's only, uh, it's less than a few kilometers across, um, and it's about six meters per pixel. So you can see there's, sort of, there's this fracturing sort of down to, uh, sort of just on the scale of uh, tens to hundreds of meters uh, there. 
Um, one thing you've also may have noticed is that uh, we see a lot of red stuff sitting around on uh, on uh, Europa, and there's quite a few of these ridges do seem to have a notable red coloration to them. Um, we think that uh, this is probably due to um, some some other. Um, this must be due to some other material, um, sort of other than water ice, that is coming up with these um, sort of being extruded out um, with the sort of warm uh, ice, um, sort of through these. Correct. Now I mentioned that uh, we think that uh, the, there's a um, because there's a magnet seems to be an induced magnetic field that there's uh, the, the subsurface ocean is kind of salty. So there may be salts uh, coming out uh, along with this um, uh, with this uh, water ice. But those salts, things like magnesium sulfate, uh, we think might be there. But um, they probably they, these things tend to be kind of colourless. Um, so it's probably something else that's coming out. And we think probably the culprit is most likely uh, sulphur. Compounds, and um, we see, of course, at Io, um, a heck of a lot of uh, sulfur covering uh, its surface in various forms there, and it's possible that uh, um, maybe uh, the, the sort of sort of the rocky mantle of uh, Europa might be a source of uh, sulfur uh, in the ocean there that is also uh, coming out and being extruded uh, with this material here. Another idea that's been thrown around is that maybe impacts onto Io might potentially throw out sulfur that escapes from Io's uh, sort, of, uh, sort of orbit and ends up landing uh, on uh, Europa. That's another way in which some might get some sulfur ending up there. And uh, let's see if this is going to work. Um, so this is naturally, uh, naturally planet modelers have uh, sort of getting, got their teeth into the idea of uh, rising Sort of ductile material on um, on Europa to sort of see if they can uh, replicate some of the features that we see uh, across. The, but yes, basically just uh, plugging in the uh, um, sort of the physical properties of uh, the ice as we think uh, they are and seeing uh, what comes out. So uh, let's see if this uh, let's do it again. Right? Uh, there we go. So this sort of has like a sort of ocean warmer flowing ice above than cold stiff ice and sort of. What we seem to have, they seem they've done here is they sort of replicated sort of the sort of ductile ice sort of uh, pushing up and sort of spreading apart the uh, brittle ice um, at the surface. So the idea is that uh, yes, this is uh, somewhat replicating some of these uh, zones of um, spreading that we think that uh, we see here. But um, there's a mass con conservation issue. Of course, you can't just have spreading more and keep adding more. Uh, spreading mass onto the surface, um, there must be some way in which uh, this mass um, can is, is exiting uh, the system. So basically, uh, is there um, if we have warm uh, sort of rising ice at these spreading zones, does it cool down and actually uh, subduct um, elsewhere? Well, there are some um, uh, people who've looked at uh, Europa and they think they've identified um, some areas where we think we may have subduction zones. So now we're getting into basically convective systems here, like uh, in Earth's mantle, and uh, basically uh, sort of possibly um, plate tectonics, uh, like on Earth, but with very different uh, materials uh, in play. So um, this uh, picture probably could have been a bit larger. I think it sort of ex uh, I think they sort of expand it. Uh, here, but um, what these uh, what this team thinks is that um, there are some locations where they think uh, some uh, sort of crumpled zones of crumpled ridges are actually truncating uh, other uh, ridges, uh, such as here is an example, and also here, and they think that these may be um, zone, zones where the uh, these uh, the ridges are actually sort of being uh, subducted uh, underneath um, these uh, sort of crumple. Uh, zones here as this uh, as this um, ice it sort of becomes cooler and therefore and denser and heavier it's coming uh, underneath um, uh, these, this this crumple zone so this is sort of a better diagram that shows what they think is uh, going on this cold brittle outer this outer ice shell that's sort of mobile on top of this warmer convecting portion of the ice shell and it's being uh, sort of pushed underneath uh, this subducting uh, plate here so yes. Um, I mean, yeah, there's certainly a lot of evidence for, um, uh, I think, uh, spreading. Um, evidence for subduction is sort of kind of harder to find, but if, if you do have spreading, then it's logical to think that you must be getting uh, material being re recycled back into the interior somewhere. This is a big question that you wrote Clipper may help us answer. So I've spoken about the uh, lineae. So these are 
basically the places where um, you have a sort of material rising along sort of along a, a line, sort of along uh, along a line on the surface. But there are um, other features such as the lenticulae, Latin for freckles, where we think uh, may have rising material in more isolated uh, spots. So these are the things called lenticulae. They form these uh, little domes on the surface. Well, they're about ten kilometres across, uh, so maybe not that little. Um, but they often, yeah, they often sort of form sort of these upwarp shapes. But some of them also seem to have what look like down warps on their uh, surfaces. And uh, the idea is that um, these things may be as a consequence of a diaperism uh, within uh, Europa's uh, sort of mobile, sort of ductile uh, portion of its water ice crust. So diaperism is basically where you have sort of a, a viscous, uh, low density sort of blob, if one of a better word, uh, as you can imagine, lava lamps or something that we sometimes uh, use as an analogy for diaperism. You have uh, this uh, warm, uh, sort of low density material rising up and um, uh, basically breaking uh, through the surface and if the material cools you may get um, uh, substance. So on Earth you could get diapirs both with sort of silica rock between magma sort of rising up and sort of uh, breaking through a brittle crust but you also get salt diaperism as well that's quite common. You form salt domes um, as the sort of low density salt rises up so these are some examples of uh, salt domes in the uh, Gulf of Mexico underwater, which also sort of have a somewhat pancakey shape, sort of like uh, these guys over here. But on Europa, this would be uh, sort of uh, again sort of localized spots of warm ice that are sort of pushing up uh, through the crust and popping up at the surface, as shown in this uh, diagram uh, here. Um, another sort of quite uh, spectacular manifestation of what we think is um, sort of disruption of the of Europa's surface by rising um, some more localized uh, areas where uh, sort of uh, viscous uh, ice is rising are the what we call the chaos uh, terrain. So uh, this is a video that takes uh, quite a while to zoom into one of the classic locations uh, of chaos called uh, Connemara Chaos. It's a uh, located just to the south of uh, this um, dramatic X formed by these uh, two lineae here. Um, let's see, it's, uh, this video is actually a couple of uh, minutes long, but I think I might uh, quickly jump to the next slide, which uh, jumps to the chase. So yeah, we'll be focusing in on this area here, and uh, this, uh, so this is what it looks like up close. So chaos is really an apt term for it. Um, what we see here is that we have all these fragments of uh, terrain that exhibit these uh, lineae here, but they're all broken up and uh, jumbled. The uh, comparison is often made to pack ice in Arctic and Antarctic oceans on Earth. It looks like, uh, you can see here, this, this is a blow up here, that's uh, 500 meters uh, there. This is a blow up of this region here. You can see that uh, some of these lineae are sort of uh, continue across these uh, broken Fragments. So this is evidently uh, all fitted together like a jigsaw at one point. And we think that uh, perhaps rising, uh, rising sort of ductile uh, ice may have actually just, uh, in this case, not created uh, upwarping, sort of like at the lenticulae, but actually broke apart this pre-existing surface, and uh, all this blocky, rubbly material may be uh, sort of some of the now sort of frozen and brittle uh, ice that uh, was ductile and rising up uh, through the uh, surface. There's also been an alternative um, hypothesis um, that's been uh, invoked to explain uh, this stuff. It's that uh, it's not actually, it's maybe not the um, sort of just warm ductile ice that's rising up, but you may get actual localized zones of melting of this ice very near to the surface. We're talking like uh, sort of hundreds of meters to a few kilometers. So you, um, they argue that you may get um, sort of sub, uh, subsurface lakes here, and that basically uh, that sort of causes the terrain above it to sort of collapse, subside, and break up to form um, this chaos terrain. I think they invoke this to um, explain sort of the very uh, sort of uh, sharp, um, sort of um, sharply defined boundaries of some of this chaos terrain, like is example they use a uh, thera macula here so um, it's it's an interesting hypothesis but um, for this sort of stuff to actually explain this um, confidently one way or the other we are probably going to need more data some sort of uh, imaging of the uh, subsurface structure in order to differentiate between these different ideas that have been brought up to explain this kind of stuff 
Now, um, impact craters are a landform that are pretty much ubiquitous across the solar system, uh, formed when you get a space rock crashing into a planetary surface. Um, they're useful because, um, well, there are a bunch of caveats associated with the technique. Um, you can sort of tell how old a surface is based on how the density of impact craters on it. So Earth has pretty few impact craters experienced. It's experienced a lot of resurfacing uh, over the course of its history that has wiped out um, uh, its impact craters that it's accumulated, while the Moon hasn't really changed at all much since uh, sort of more than four, three to four billion uh, years ago. So that's why it's kept all of its impact craters that are uh, formed early on in its history. Europa, um, as you uh, might expect based on what I've told you so far, um, has very few impact craters uh, all across its surface, which uh, again sort of is, um, demonstrates uh, sort of the active resurfacing that has gone on uh, all across Europa's history, this constant uh, sort of um, constant <coughs> renewing of its surface by upwelling of ice that forms new crust and probably downwelling. Um, but um, it does still does play some uh, impact craters, but they are for the most part very modified, and even more so the larger they get. Um, for these sorts of uh, craters here on uh, the terrestrial planets, um, craters of this size would normally be very deep. They'd have steep wall, steep terraced walls, flat floors, um, uh, central peaks. These things more look, look more like bullseyes with these concentric ridges uh, forming them. And in fact, um, I told you earlier the sort of the <coughs> estimate of the thickness of uh, Europa's sort of outer ice shell was 10 to 30 kilometers. These craters are kind of our best uh, way to estimate that uh, number because we can sort of see the onset diameter of um, sort of these things coming uh, sort of very shallow for their diameters and uh, sort of uh, basically modeling sort of how uh, warm ductile ice at depth would sort of viscously relax to infill their topography. Note that some of these smaller craters, they can only penetrate down into just the still the brittle topmost layers, so they get to retain their bowl-shaped topography, stuff that's very large like this um, is uh, going to infill pretty quickly from the, due to the sort of flow of the ductile ice, and of course eventually they'll get torn to pieces by all the uh, lineae that are constantly crisscrossing across the surface. So yeah, um, and a useful window into the subsurface uh, Europa's impact craters. Now something that's ruffled a few feathers uh, in the last, over the last decade, um, of course with all this talk about um, sort of an active subsurface ocean that's uh, renewing uh, Europa's surface um, in the ways I've uh, showed you, there's been uh, the question asked, is it possible that you could ever get um, the sort of actual contact between uh, liquid, uh, sort of subsurface liquid and the surface, and um, this sort of uh, fed some fuel to that uh, debate. Uh, back in 2012, uh, some astronomers using the uh, Hubble Space Telescope reckoned that they saw uh, plumes jetting out of the south polar region of uh, Europa. Um, this is an image here of, uh, sort of what they think is uh, sort of this uh, sort of increased density of material here that they, they think that might be plumes. Uh, jetting out. Um, it's something that um, is, uh, I think was only seen uh, sporadically, so such plumes, uh, if they really do exist, would be um, episodic. Um, the most famous, most well-known, well, I think pretty much the only other example in the solar system where we see plumes jetting out of the South Pole is uh, Saturn's moon Enceladus, which the Cassini spacecraft saw to be happening pretty much uh, constantly, and I think it even flew through them. Uh, a couple of times. So Enceladus is sort of a somewhat similar story to Europa. It's also tidally squeezed by Saturn, and we think it also has a uh, subsurface ocean. Um, the, Europan, uh, the Europan plumes, um, it's, yes, it's, it's quite possible they may be there. It's a little, um, it's a little tricky to say um, sort of uh, exactly, to, to sort of pin down their nature. And again, they haven't been seen at uh, other times. So that may be due to the fact that there isn't, uh, there aren't plumes at um, other times, or maybe there, there aren't always plumes, but sometimes they're below our detection threshold. And uh, this is another thing that um, Europa Clipper is going to be designed to uh, investigate. Um, whether these things uh, do really exist or not. And if they do, then it'd uh, be super useful because uh, we'd be able to fly through them uh, with a, uh, a mass spectrometer, um, basically to gather particles. And so you can, that would mean that you can basically uh, test in situ um, uh, sort of particles of 
uh, Europa's subsurface ocean um, sort of without having to drill below, because that's what we think they would be resulting from um, is, uh, is um, sort of uh, Europa's uh, subsurface water actually accessing the surface and being uh, forced out, um, sort of uh, through the pressure forcing it out um, to form these uh, plumes. And of course, um, we've uh, been talking about subsurface ocean all this time, and actually this has fed into uh, the uh, debate over whether Europa may be one of the best, uh, most promising locations in the solar system uh, to uh, find uh, sort of extraterrestrial life. It seems to tick uh, quite a few boxes. It's got, uh, it's got, water, it's got a lot of water, much more than all Earth's oceans. It's got um, things like salt, uh, sulfurous stuff. Um, it's got a, sort of quite a, quite a few elements um, that um, we sort of help Sort of uh, for sort of the genesis of life, chemical energy, and it's also we really think been stable this ocean across a uh, Europa's um, billion year uh, history. So um, the idea is that um, so Europa's ice shell is melted at depth to form the subsurface ocean, but its uh, interior, its rocky interior, is also being squeezed, and so uh, this has um, created the idea. That maybe we get Vulcan sub uh, sub sea volcanism happening at the bottom of its of its ocean, and uh, one of the most dramatic ways we see that on Earth is uh, the hydrothermal vents that occur at the bottom of uh, at these sort of um, uh, uh, mid ocean ridges um, on, on on Earth. Um, this is uh, if we can uh, maybe cut the uh, microphone here at the moment, since I'll, we have a bit of uh, issues with distortion. Um, but uh, this is a little video created by Noah, that uh, sort of has a very excited presenter uh, talking about this. Uh, is it? Uh, I, don't, I think the sound on. What's the scale on that? It's on the, the projector. Hmm. Oh, uh, is, your is your laptop? Oh, okay. Um, uh, Okay, and I don't think it really matters. I think it's, uh, I can probably explain it anyway. So the scale of these things, um, these uh, black smokers, um, they're basically where we have um, uh, sort of uh, water um, from underneath the, uh, water, uh, water uh, uh, in the Earth's crust that is um, being jetted out. It's very rich in uh, magnesium, things like um, uh, sulfates, and uh, this stuff deposits around uh, these vents and it creates these enormous towers. They can be reach, I think, 60 meters high, the largest of them, so uh, tens of uh, meters. And uh, they're, um, and as we can see, they have these thriving ecosystems uh, around them. So the idea is that uh, maybe if uh, Europa's uh, mantle has also been heated, um, like uh, sort of through tidal means, maybe it also um, sort of has similar sort of interaction between its um, sort of similar volcanic interaction between the uh, mantle and the ocean, and maybe some of these places could be uh, zones uh, where you could get uh, sort of life uh, originate. Although, again, this, still, this um, feeds back into the question of how do you begin life at all. It's something we're not entirely sure about on Earth, and uh, I guess one thing to consider is that, yes, we have chemical energy, but um, I think on Earth, these, uh, the life we see at these, uh, in these trenches ultimately uh, arrived there from elsewhere and adapted. Um, on Europa, you would have, you would never really, light would never really come into the equation. It would pretty much have to uh, start um, down, down here. Um, so yes, and that's another thing that uh, Europa Clipper may sort of help us advance our knowledge, but um, I think really to get a uh, total, uh, to, to get confirmation, it's something you would eventually have to sample uh, Europa's ocean directly to um, dispel any um, any uh, any any doubt about that there's life there. So um, okay, that's uh, basically a summary of uh, sort of Europa's surface geology and why we think its uh, geology looks the way it does. So um, no, uh, since the Galileo uh, mission, um, perhaps actually even during the Galileo mission, there are various proposals put forward to return to the uh, Jovian. Uh, system with a uh, orbiter to uh, investigate in more detail the um, uh, the uh, it, its Galilean moons. Partly, uh, Galileo was great, but it didn't quite live up to its uh, promise because of its uh, the malfunction it had with its antenna. I mean, it means it couldn't send back as much data as we'd like, so we were sold short a bit in uh, that respect. Um, 
But uh, eventually, uh, in, two, uh, in sort of early this decade, um, the Europa Clipper mission was selected as um, one of uh, NASA's so-called large strategic uh, science missions, what was pre previously known as the flagship missions, sort of big hitters like Cassini and the <coughs> Science Laboratory and the Mars 2020 rover. Um, this was created as a joint project between uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory in uh, Maryland, and the Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory, although there are many other partners as well providing uh, certain instruments. And uh, it's kind of neat because it will be operational at the same time as the European Space Agency's uh, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, which uh, kind of makes them an uh, elegant acronym to choose. Um, so that's going to orbit Jupiter around the same time uh, as uh, the Europa Clipper. That's going to perform uh, flybys of uh, the icy Galilean moons, and uh, that will eventually go into orbit around Ganymede, the next moon out, um, in 2032. So, um, so why uh, is, would Europa Euro Clipper be a, a thing? Well, uh, I guess hopefully I'll um, sort of uh, conveyed to you in the talk so far, sort of uh, re reasons why it's, uh, we need to return back. Uh, sort of there are a lot more uh, unanswered questions as to um, its geology, how its surface geology um, sort of interacts with the ocean, how coupled its surface is with a uh, subsurface ocean, and of course outstanding questions related to could the life have uh, originated here. So um, it's going to investigate um, pretty much every aspect we can of uh, Europa. Um, uh, study its uh, surface composition, its geology, potential ongoing activity, and just perform general reconnaissance. So uh, that basically means sort of mapping the surface to the uh, best degree uh, that we that we can, creating uh, topography uh, topography maps, uh, for instance. So it's going to be fitted out with a uh, an arsenal of uh, different instruments, uh, which sort of acronym soup spread around uh, over here. A whole bunch of instruments to. Uh, investigate the in situ, the environment surrounding Europa, uh, as well as sort of remote sensing of its uh, surface geology. And uh, this uh, explains a bunch of the uh, acronyms here. So uh, the yellow is uh, stuff that's going to measure stuff in situ, uh, blue is remote sensing. It's going to carry a mass spectrometer, which basically is going to um, collect uh, particles around uh, Europa and sort of uh, send them through this uh, mass spectrometer to sort of see what, uh, basically analyze the composition of uh, material it finds around uh, Europa. Um, so one thing uh, I haven't mentioned thus far is that Europa does actually have an incredibly thin atmosphere. It's like, a, I think, about a trillion times thinner than Earth. So it's, uh, it's not really an atmosphere as we sort of think it, uh, but uh, there is definitely a sort of a very thin cloak of uh, Sort of this gas, uh, mostly oxygen gas, uh, around Europa, so it will certainly get close enough to Europa to be able to um, sample uh, some of that. Um, there's also a, 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 um, a dust analyzer here that um, that will uh, sort of a, that the hope is that's where we do find plumes, and then in which case this thing is uh, suited to actually flying through these plumes and collecting uh, particles that will. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, allow us to sort of analyze Pluto's surface sort of in situ by having these uh, particles being jetted out. We don't uh, have to uh, sort of land and drill. We can sort of, we can have this stuff basically served to us on a plate uh, in orbit. Um, it's also going to uh, carry a magnetometer, so uh, this will investigate in more detail um, the nature of uh, uh, Europa's subsurface ocean, sort of uh, how deep it is, how under the ice shell, and also its uh, salinity. And um, something I have absolutely no authority to talk about is uh, the plasma environment uh, <laughs> around uh, uh, Europa. So um, yes, yeah, so that's um, one part of planetary science I um, know very little about. Basically, sort of examining sort of the charged particle environment, sort of uh, how your, uh, Jupiter's magnetic field and particles and trains sort of tracked in its uh, magnetic field lines will sort of interact uh, with Europa. Um, as for um, sort of your remote sensing uh, stuff, it's going to carry a bunch of cameras of different uh, wavelengths, um, a ultraviolet spectrograph, which is useful for determining, uh, mapping out uh, surface uh, composition, and also uh, another means to study the surface, the uh, composition of the uh, plume. The um, thing that uh, I guess I'm most excited about, of course, is the juicy pictures that will send back its imaging system in the visible wavelength. Has both a wide-angle camera for context and a narrow-angle camera for um, super high-resolution uh, images. Um, two infrared cameras, um, let's see, uh, third-world imager, that's, uh, I think, 
is that far, I think mid to far infrared, I sort of get those mixed up, but uh, that will search for um, hot spots on the surface, so I've talked about um, sort of rising warm material, forming things like the lineae, and uh, perhaps the chaos and the lenticuli, that should help us to actually map out uh, the surface of um, uh, Europa's uh, surface uh, temperature and see if we can identify where some of these hot spots uh, are, where we may be getting some of this rising uh, material sort of during uh, the flyby. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so the, um, the, um, this other infrared uh, spectrometer here is another way to identify um, uh, some of the surface uh, composition. But then the final neat thing it's going to take is something that's particularly close to my heart because I did quite a lot of um, work during my PhD on Mars of um, radar sounding um, from the uh, European uh, Mars Express um, uh, uh, spacecraft. It is going to carry a nice penetrating uh, radar. This basically um, uh, transmits um, radi uh, radio waves into um, Europa's subsurface and uh, there's this uh, um, property called the dielectric constant that materials have um, that uh, the contrast in dielectric constant between sort of an ice shell and sort of a liquid ocean underneath will cause the uh, radio wave to bounce back um, to the uh, to the spacecraft. And so, by measuring the sort of time delay, you can basically see um, sort of you can map out the depth um, quite accurately of a um, subsurface discontinuity. So, a way we in which we want to try and map out the um, discontinuity. Uh, out the base of um, uh, Europa's ice shell. Um, it'll be interesting to see how well this works out. Uh, we estimate 10 to 30 kilometers thickness, that's quite a lot of ice, to uh, transmit uh, a radio wave through, have it reflect, and sort of have a measurable signal when you get back. If the, um, if the ocean is quite saline, that should create quite a strong signal, but um, We'll have to see it. Um, we may find that um, we can only sort of uh, sort of get signals returned from places where it's quite shallow, um, sort of like maybe some of the lakes I mentioned early. But um, yeah, it has the potential to be a big payoff if we can, if we find we can uh, map out the um, uh, subsurface ocean, uh, map out the ice shelf depth to an accurate degree, see if it agrees with um, sort of the uh, estimates that we've um, cr uh, come up with based on studying the surface geology. So. Yeah, that should be quite an exciting thing. It would also be quite a power-hungry thing, and uh, power is another issue when you're out in the outer solar system. So if a decision was taken um, to actually power um, the Europa Clipper with solar arrays, Jupiter is about as far as you can get in the solar system for a solar arrays to be a viable power source, um, as Juno, the Juno uh, spacecraft that's currently orbiting Jupiter has shown that it is uh, possible, it's currently studying Jupiter's atmosphere. Um, at the moment, they do have to be pretty hefty, though, uh, basketball court sized uh, to be specific. So, um, yes, this gives an idea of how big it will be. Uh, yeah, Cassini was also uh, pretty enormous, sort of like fan sized. Um, this is, uh, so yeah, this is, it'll be its uh, route to uh, Jupiter. This um, animation here is already out of date. This was made back when the launch date was 2023. It's now 2025. But um, this has one scenario where it's direct to Jupiter um, trajectory. There's also a possibility they might do some flybys around Venus as a gravitational slingshot. But um, yes, the idea is that yeah, it would, uh, in this scenario, it would take uh, several years to get to Jupiter. Um, this one shows its sort of trajectory when it arrives at Jupiter, these increasingly tight orbits uh, around the planet. And this is its sort of a, its um, uh, itinerary. Uh, so it will be orbiting Jupiter, do 46 Europa flybys, uh, as well as a few of the outer uh, icy moons as well, four of Ganymede and uh, nine of uh, Callisto. So the thing to take away here is that it's not actually going to, going to go into orbit around Europa itself. And the reason is that is because of a. Uh, Jupiter's lethal um, <coughs> radiation environment. So uh, Europa Clipper will instead go into orbit around uh, Jupiter and perform multiple flybys of Europa. If it were to go into orbit around Europa, um, it would uh, be exposed con constantly to sort of the radiation uh, that's, a, um, that's a feature of Jupiter's uh, extremely strong magnetosphere, and it would probably last only about two months uh, before its electronics get fried. So the idea is to do um, multiple uh, orbits of uh, Jupiter where it's sort of uh, taken in closely to get its measurements and then it goes far out to sort of its cool down time so it's not constantly in um, 
uh, the radiation belts, and this little, um, uh, yeah, this is kind of a neat animation that sort of shows a radiation meter here. So here it's just arrived at Jupiter, it's on its initial broad orbit here, and then you see a spike in radiation as it goes uh, close to Jupiter. So, yeah, it's basically, it has very little cumulative <coughs> radiation uh, as a result uh, of this. But um, another thing to consider is that um, it can, the spacecraft can gather data um, much quicker than it can send it back to Earth. So it makes sense to have some downtime far away from Jupiter for it to turn its antenna and transmit data back to Earth. If it was constantly orbiting Europa, it would sort of, uh, yeah, that would be, it would be spending sort of, it would, it would be trying to spend a lot of its time uh, sort of gathering data and then as, as well as uh, sending it back. So it makes sense to sort of, um, uh, yeah, have these separate times for separate uh, activities. But you'll see now it's sort of in its advanced uh, mission here. It's on its uh, several, um, its multiple tight orbits, and um, yeah, it just it only spikes when it's uh, close by. Now the um, the Juice uh, Europe's Juice orbiter that's going to go into orbit around Ganymede, but the environment out there, the radiation environment, is not as severe, so that can actually survive in orbit around Ganymede. Uh, and not be totally fried to uh, nothingness. Um, this is what its uh, sort of uh, close-up um, itinerary will be at uh, Europa. So the fact that it's in orbit around Jupiter and not Europa means that it has a limited range of um, sort of trajectories that it has around Europa. You'll notice that um, uh, its, uh, its trajectories take it close to its the anti-Jovian and the sub-Jovian sides of Europa, not so much the um, sort of leading and uh, trailing hemispheres, you can see there's Jupiter appearing in the uh, background there, but it's still, um, it's still uh, um, even though it doesn't get close up to these parts, it will still provide um, some incredibly good uh, reconnaissance, I think it's, uh, like I say in the next slide, will be about 50 meters pixel mapping for about 95% of the surface, so in much, much better than what we have for uh, with, Gal uh, with the uh, Galileo. And I think these are just a few quite small maps of uh, the coverage of various uh, instruments, which you can see is sort of uh, kind of tend to be best at these uh, opposing uh, hemispheres here. Uh, so, oh yeah, so just some more text uh, talking about that. So, um, uh, but also um, these uh, these different trajectories um, will be achieved by basically doing gravity assists as it uh, flies by. Uh, the various satellites, so it can basically get a slight slingshot that will change its orbital trajectory, so then it can, when it comes back, it's looking at a different part to what it looked at uh, before. And uh, let's see, I think it said 46 flybys in one of the other slides, so let's just say mid-40s will be the number of flybys that it will do. Uh, over three and a half years, um, yeah, under 5 percent to 50 meters per pixel, and uh, help minimize its uh, time in a high radiation environment, and all of its uh, operations can be uh, automated, um, pretty simple uh, <coughs> operations of cameras uh, sort of being um, uh, programmed to point in certain directions that's flying by. I think the, uh, oh yes, this is, um, let's see if it's going to play or am I going to have to jolt it? Okay, here it goes. This is um, an animation of a typical flyby that lasts a few minutes. So these are the various instruments down here, the ones that are active are marked uh, sort of uh, with these buttons. <coughs> Here and uh, so we'll see as we approach um, Europa, um, they start to become more and more active. Um, okay, I'm going to have to try and remember which the which acronyms correspond to which instruments. But the magnetometer is sort of always operating, always measuring the magnetic uh, environment. Um, now it's starting to do some uh, let's see some thermal uh, imaging as well. Um, yeah, infrared stuff. Now it's doing some uh, panning back and forth. And the top two are the visible, so now it's starting to take some visible images of the surface. And as it gets closer and closer, when it's um, at closest approach, you'll see everything just light up like Christmas as it's getting it, uh, sort of all the highest resolution data for this particular uh, flyby. So let's see. So it puts wide context images, then now some narrow, sort of, sort of high resolution, everything's going and now it's uh, retreating, so uh, the uh, data collection yeah, is now uh, petering away. But um, yeah, this is how it was for Pluto. Unfortunately, there at Pluto, we only got one flyby, so 
whiz and it's gone. This one will be able to do like 45 or so uh, times each one, looking at a slightly different part of the surface. So, yeah, that's this is how it's uh, going to go down. Yeah, let's see. Um, oh, and this is a neat little animation well, of the. Uh, uh, hopefully, um, again, these plumes, as far as we can detect from Earth, are quite uh, sporadic. We'll find out when we get there as to whether these plumes are actually consistent and whether maybe sometimes they're more active than at other times. But um, so the uh, idea is to yes, we'll first sort of look for these plumes, and then one of our trajectories we'll be able to uh, fly through these, and that's when our mass spectrometer and uh, uh, one of the other instruments really come into their own and try and gather some of these, uh, some of the material we think is being jetted out uh, directly from the uh, subsurface ocean. So another thing I'll quickly mention um, is, uh, as well as um, having a multiple flyby mission, there have also, in the last decade, been ideas for a lander concept uh, on Europa. So if you want to sort of get proper in situ composition um, measurements, uh, well, you would certainly want to land it somewhere quite youthful, where you think uh, there's been recent upwelling uh, sort of from subsurface material, maybe you can be able to sample some of this recently, um, sort of material that's been recently deposited uh, onto the subsurface. And um, so, yes, in the last few years, um, Europa Lander was uh, agreed upon, I think, for a bit, but now it's in limbo, and uh, this is all down to politics. Uh, there was a particular senator from uh, Texas, actually John Colberson, who was instrumental in getting co congressional funds for the Europa Clipper, and this was actually thrown on as well, but now he's lost his seat, it's currently in limbo. And there's also it's kind of a disagreement in the community as uh, well, something I have quite a front seat for, because there are some of my co-workers uh, in the thick of it, as to whether um, it's so, uh, the wisdom of having a lander so close to the, um, the orbiter. So I think the um, original idea was to have a lander um, be included with the orbiter and that it would land sort of at the same time as the um, orbiter um, is doing its uh, reconnaissance. Um, I think then the idea came along that um, it would then be launched separately but it would still land uh, around the same time. Um, I think, okay, here I have a, just a few um, sort, of, uh, I, sort of ideas for what a lander would achieve. Um, sort of search by signatures, assess habitability of Europa by in situ techniques and uh, also get a, a view of actually what the surface looks like uh, up close. But I'll um, skip to this slide because um, the thing is, uh, it's probably not such a brilliant idea to um, try and land something on the surface of uh, this object which has kind of an unknown surface at sort of the scale of what we'd be landing at meters. We can only at the moment characterize its surface down to sort of tens of meters with six meter pixel imaging. Um, so uh, some of my colleagues at uh, NASA Ames, including Orcan, um, have done a modeling investigation of uh, how ice should sublimate at the surface of uh, Europa with a varying uh, latitude. So sublimation, basically when you get uh, ice um, goes straight from the solid to the uh, gaseous uh, phase. Um, and uh, so yes, they're investigating some sort of sublimation rate across the surface and um, they're finding that uh, in the uh, in the equatorial regions, you would get quite enhanced sublimation that should um, give rise to these uh, landforms we call penitentes. Here, these are um, basically very jagged sublimation uh, landforms that we see on Earth at high altitude equatorial um, uh, ice fields, which on Earth is pretty much confined to the Andes. These both of these examples are in Chile. They're quite spectacular. They're about a few meters high they get to, they're basically just uh, formed, these, uh, these, uh, they're directed towards the sort of mean position of the sun in the sky at that time, so uh, they're basically these, uh, these are ridges that are aligned, uh, formed due to sublimation and they're aligned um, with the uh, direction of the sun. And um, this modeling uh, sort of study of, um, uh, by my colleagues suggests that uh, similar penitentes uh, to probably, it's, it's reasonable to think from their modeling that they're at the surface of, um, in the equatorial regions of uh, Europa, where a lander would most likely end up landing, it's harder to land, at the poles. Um, and they think that their results are um, somewhat consistent with the um, Galileo uh, thermal and sort of uh, thermal and radar data, but these things would be like 15 meters high, jaggedness we're talking about. Um, 
And so, uh, yes, it was uh, sort of um, acknowledged in, I think, their study uh, that uh, this would have implications for a uh, potential uh, lander. So, um, yes, as the um, slide title implies, um, I think I would say it's probably best maybe for a, uh, not to jump into a lander mission on, um, uh, on Europa just yet. I mean, there are arguments between lander advocates and uh, my colleagues, uh, sort of, uh, they say uh, they 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 have issues, um, but sort of uh, compared to what we've uh, the, mod the, mo the modeling shows compared to the laboratory experiments. But I think it's probably just the best uh, better idea to put things off until you have a proper reconnaissance of the surface, which your clipper will provide before you jump into the uh, sort of the multi-billion-dollar lander that you don't want to be impaled on. Uh, this <laughs> stuff. I mean, I guess with the Viking landers. We didn't really know what Mars looked like, um, sort of on the meter scale, and that worked out well enough. But mm. when you've got a sort of yeah water ice surface that has potentially responded to sunlight in this way, yeah, you might want to uh, wait a bit. So um, yes, yeah, so but again, the lander is still currently in the limbo. <coughs> so yes, don't count on uh, sort of uh, surface level holiday pictures of Europa probably in the next decade or so. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, yes, that is actually the last slide I had. So I hope I've conveyed to you what an interesting world Europa is, sort of, uh, sort of yes, um, and all these sort of high-level science questions uh, that uh, derive uh, from it and uh, how it's a worthy place to uh, revisit. And um, it's, yes, if I uh, hopefully carry on in planetary science, my grants keep getting funded, it's uh, something I may find well, hopefully, uh, a lot of outer solar system scientists will probably find themselves involved in this in some way or other um, in the sort of decade after after next. Um, so, uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Um, basically, it's uh, life emerging there as it has done on Earth. So, yes, life as we know it uh, appearing there. Habitability, uh, I don't think humans would want to be there anytime soon because of the radiation really glistos the outermost Galilean moon. That's the, if you're going to visit the Jupiter system, that's where you want to go first. It's benign, it's, it's kind of a dead world, it doesn't have radiation, it's comparatively comfortable. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. After the Cassini probe, the Solidus became kind of a hot, yes, alternative term satellite in terms of possibility of examining the water and jets and determining yeah. its life. Is there? I guess what I'm asking is, between Europa and Enceladus, which one is focusing interest most right now in terms of? Um, exploration. Well, definitely uh, Europa because of the forthcoming Europa Clipper. I think, yes, soon after the discovery of uh, I think like the plumes on Enceladus, there were sort of excited um, sort of conversation about uh, sending, a, um, sending an orbiter specific, yes, sort of Enceladus or multiple flyby mission to Enceladus that, that this time had sort of the proper, uh, proper instrumentation that we kitted out with because, um, yes, the Cassini, um, Cassini orbit didn't really have the appropriate instrumentation to study in situ its jets. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, Europa really uh, sort of has won in that respect, and now the forthcoming um, focus on the Saturn system will be the Dragonfly Titan octocopter drone that is, uh, was selected earlier a few months ago. Um, so that's 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 probably going to eat up quite a bit of the. Titan, uh, oh, Saturn, uh, sort of workers in the coming years, well, uh, Europa um, will be sort of, yeah, Europa will be sort of the, where emphasis on plumes will be. So, yes, in some of us, I think it's going to have to wait. <laughs> we'll see what we find at Europa, yeah. Um, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, would it be possible to um, build a radiation hardened spacecraft that could actually orbit a Europa. Uh, is that a technical possibility? It's 
I think it's possible, but um, the question is what would it involve, what materials would then go into radiation hardened, and what would the eventual mass of the spacecraft be? Because, uh, yes, um, I mean, these missions, their cost ultimately sort of depends, well, yeah, a lot of it depends on the weight of what you're flying. If, um, if you have a very radiation hardened um, sort of spacecraft that sort of weighs a massive amount more than if it wasn't, um, then it would be a hell of a lot more uh, expensive. And uh, you may find that ultimately this solution gets you sort of pretty much as good data, um, but without that uh, added uh, cost. Um, Yes, so I think it's been I think it's been brought up that issue, but uh, yes, I think um, I know there's also an IO. Uh, there's an, there's been an I, uh, a idea floated for an IO mission that would also be a multiple flyby. So I think that's pretty much what people are going with. A radiation hardening would be sort of too expensive, probably with the materials involved, and um, I think also with um, also you'd have to you would probably have to try and contain the entire thing in this radiation I think all your electronics and that would create issues with respect to um, sort of uh, being able to sort of, uh, I guess get certain instruments to sort of look at certain times and mechanics involved with that. With the, with the multiple flyby you could just let everything hang out basically uh, on the sort of outside the spacecraft you don't have to um, sort of yes close things up and open hatches and that creates more potential for things to go wrong uh, yes yeah. Um, oh, okay, I might start further down and go back up. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about the uh, difference between the four Galileo yes. moons and uh, quite, quite a bit of difference. And I was wondering what the current thinking is on planet on moon formation, uh, why they're so different, uh, if there is such thinking, and maybe it has something to do with the way planets move um, as well. So, yes, uh, let's see, I might as well go back to showing them all their glory. So, um, the, the idea is that... Um, uh, so, why so different is my question. So, yes, um, the idea is that these probably ultimately would have looked somewhat similar when they formed four and a half billion years ago, and that's uh, the different, differing tidal heating is why they look uh, so different um, now. So, Callisto is the farthest out of the Galilean satellites. It's the least um, influenced from Jupiter's um, uh, uh, gravity. And I don't think it's in a tidal resonance with the others. So tidal heating effect at least there. Um, and so basically it's managed to preserve its uh, sort of heavily impacted surface throughout its uh, history because there hasn't been any interior dissipation of heat that sort of creates um, sort of some of the uh, Great melting and that would sort of create resurfacing through sort of some of the, me some of the uh, mechanisms that have happened on the other satellites. Ganymede is interesting because it shows some parts that um, look fairly well preserved, um, these uh, sort of more cratered parts here, but it also sort of shows uh, these uh, sort of like fracture belts uh, across its surface that are somewhat, um, uh, somewhat similar to what we see on uh, Europa. So that's sort of like it's been partially resurfaced. Um, Europa is um, it's not hot enough to be it's not hot enough to have uh, completely sort of had its ice boiled off, but it is uh, warm enough to have a what we think a global subsurface ocean and all the sort of uh, geological activity in its uh, outer ice shell uh, derived from that. And Io, the innermost, is the hottest and angriest of all. It's the closest to Jupiter. It sort of uh, experiences the most um, in heating from the tidal resonances. And so that's boiled off all its ice, and it's so it's incredibly volcanic. Isn't, isn't there a, a difference in material in, in uh, composition? Um, well, probably not so much maybe for their cores. I mean, the the, the main difference in composition is that between Io and the others. But that's because uh, Io is really it, 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 it's too hot to retain any of its ice. So that's. That's not a difference due to the initial formation. That's a difference that sort of uh, evolved uh, over time as it's uh, lost its volatile ices, um, while the others have uh, retained theirs. But the volatile ices of the others have been messed around with to varying degrees based on the different uh, heating. So, yeah, I don't think we have any reason to suspect, suspect that they were enormously different uh, compositions uh, when they started out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does the presence of higher levels of radiation supersede the ability for water to maintain life because the radiation would just like break the cells apart? Um, or does it not work like that? 
So I'm not sure to what extent, I mean, under a 10 to 30 kilometer thick ice crust, and if you've got stuff at the bottom of a 100 kilometer ocean, I mean, yeah, I think that would provide a pretty decent shield. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> probably say much more than that because I'm not quite sure myself about uh, sort of the effect of radiation on life forms and sort of what is a sort of a, a sufficient shield or not. I mean, certainly if you were to get, this is one, although it's an interesting thing to consider with respect to trying to uh, determine if there are biosignatures in material that's ejected um, from um, uh, sort of from in these perhaps these plumes getting being ejected out from the uh, subsurface. So I would think stuff in the ocean itself would be pretty safe with what, considering what it's covered by. But um, there's a question of yes, uh, how how much would sort of biological material sort of uh, dissociate as soon as it's sort of being released into a space environment? And if we were to collect that, would we still be able to recognise it? Because yeah, I mean any bacteria getting thrown out is going to be yeah knocked off pretty quickly but uh yeah and uh, again we sort of use the word bio signatures quite a lot not to imply necessarily bugs being thrown out but also just sort of sort of byproducts of uh, life for instance um yes yeah so yes um that's yeah pretty much my what i reckon is going on there um, yeah go ahead um, i was wondering if anybody has ever observed your own by using x-rays um I don't really know myself. I figured yeah. someone must have looked at it that way at some point, but uh, yes, I don't know if it's been done or if what's been found, so <laughs> I'm afraid I can't help you out on that one. Yes. Uh, yeah. What measures have people been thinking of to protect uh, contamination if we go? Yes, so this is looking into the far future yeah, now. Yeah. <sighs> well, Sterilization, of course, of your um, instrumentation is necessary. Of course, that would be a hell of a sterilization job because you'll be kind of be carrying an oil rig sized machinery with you. I mean, uh, 10 kilometers to 30 kilometers. I mean, we're having, as I mentioned earlier, we're having difficulty digging down six feet into Mars with insight at the moment. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, planetary protection is kind of a sort of a legitimate job description for some people I know now who are, so, because it hasn't quite been, I don't think it's quite been sort of consistent policy in the past either. There are some landers that have been sent sort of which haven't really been properly sterilized uh, in the past, um, but that's something that seems to be rather more, rather larger in the, a rather larger consideration in planetary missions now. Um, Yes, and of course the more hardware you're sending, the harder it is to uh, make sure that but yeah, what you're sending is not contaminated. Um, so, I mean, it, yes, it would be a pretty, it would be a massive uh, issue. Is emitting the instruments on the surface for a while while that radiation might uh, Yes, um, <laughs> maybe. Um, of course there are some that, are, that we find are quite hardy, such so, so, so I think some of the, one of the surveyors that landed on the moon in the 60s it uh, was brought back by Apollo 12 astronauts and they found that some bacteria managed to uh, stick, managed to survive in like a um, uh, uh, sort of hibernation uh, and apparently managed to be reanimated back on back on earth so um yes never underestimate uh, life's will <laughs> but yes um certainly your own for radiation belts that's a lot bigger deal than at the moon i think so I think you could fairly safely say um, that would be a natural um, sterilization <laughs> method. Oh, yeah. Um, after it's in place and beginning to take its measurements, <clears throat> how soon will the data be coming back? Oh, pretty much right as soon, as soon after. I mean, yes, it will be um, taking data as it's close in, and then when it's far out, it will be sending data back. So we'll get, um, I think it'll be like a flyby every sort of few weeks to a month, something like that. I mean, if it's like 45 flybys over three and a half years, that maybe works out about a month or so. So it would provide constant sort of updates, yeah. Yeah. I want to ask two separate questions. Mm -hmm. One, the, mo the underlying motivation, this might be unspoken, but you can tell, uh -huh. for all this uh, moon exploration it, it is life. Well, no. if, if were it not for life, what come, what were it second? Who's vice president? 
So yes, to uh, ask one question. Forget life. What's the second most overlooked? Okay. All the, and the next thing I want to ask, I guess simply yes or no, is the um, the, the hydrodynamics or aerodynamics of Jupiter's uh, atmosphere a, a, a settled question now, or is that wide open? Um, the second question, all right. Um, I think that's a safe answer is no. Um, yeah, I. My, um, I, I mostly look at solid surface stuff. Uh, so yes, I guess the uh, yes, what the, the situation with the understanding of Jupiter's atmosphere. Um, I know that sort of that's kind of probably being formulated at the moment, advanced with the results being sent back by the Jupiter uh, the Juno mission. Um, I'm I'm not really at the forefront of that, so I'm not sure. But I think it's yes, it's probably st still something in uh, sort of. Ideas are being formulated, um, sort of as we get data back. Um, as for the first question, so in a way, yes, I'm kind of the vice president you speak of because I don't really study life, sort of the habitable, habitable uh, habitability of environments uh, so much. I'm more planetary geology interested in sort of the processes that uh, sort of uh, have uh, caused um, sort of the land landscapes of these different um, sort of planetary bodies to evolve. So. Um, I guess uh, the vice president's view is that I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, getting sort of a good idea of how this um, ice world, uh, sort of with a sub liquid subsurface ocean, uh, operates. How it's sub sort of getting a much better, clearer idea of how its surface geology is coupled to its subsurface. How much interaction there is between the two, and uh, to what extent maybe how the two are potentially in, uh, insulated from each other. And I showed some like different hypotheses uh, here of um, things like sort of where we might expect liquid water, how high it might get into in the crust, or if it never gets really close to the crust, and if it's just sort of warm ice that's sort of doing most of the interaction. This is something that's, um, there have been sort of separate schools of thought, I think, in the Europa, Europa community. Um, uh, over the decades, um, sort of some have proposed of a thin ice um, sort of model where the ocean gets very close to the surface um, with quite a thin, uh, brittle ice crust. Although I think it's more popular now the idea that it's a thicker crust with sort of a um, sort of a warmer, sort of lower uh, part that's sort of doing the main interaction with the ocean. So yes, um, I think this is the first time we really will get to sort of have sort of get to throw a lot of uh, good. Um, sort of science and observations uh, at um, one of these unique worlds that up until now we've sort of, um, uh, yes, we sort of speculated somewhat uh, based on sort of our understanding of how we think these materials behave in their environments, but uh, some more proper geophysical sort of subsurface uh, of observations would uh, really help us um, sort of, yeah, get an idea of how an ocean world works like this. Um, so yes, and yeah, life ultimately doesn't come into that uh, question, but it's uh, yeah, it's one I think is uh, very um, quite pertinent because there are other places in the solar system like Enceladus that are to some extent maybe similar to this, and we think actually a lot of the um, sort of outer solar system objects, we think Pluto uh, probably has subsurface ocean depth, but much deeper than. Um, uh, Europa, so interaction is probably much less there than it is on Europa. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we get second, a second question, um, and segues right into what you were saying, uh, uh, talking about now, what explains the double ridges, uh, the fact that there's uh, a double ridge line uh, and not um, a single one? Yes, so I think perhaps well, maybe what's happening, you've got a, a fracture opening and um, sort of like what happens at the mid-ocean ridges on Earth, you get materials of a single column of warm material that moves up, but once it um, reaches the surface, it sort of um, bifurcates and uh, sort of sort of uh, sort of spreads outwards to create these uh, uh, two ridges. Um, so it's it's basically it has the freedom to expand laterally uh, at that point. Um, sort of again, sort of like what happens with uh, mid-ocean ridges on Earth, the crust, the f sort of the sort of the molten sort of silicate rock. Is that um, sort of a, a thermodynamic effect? Um, sort of, yes. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, if it's sort of you know, the fact that it forms ridges means that it's uh, sort of perhaps, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, 
um, sort of maybe initially warmer and then sort of cools down on there. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it would actually cool extremely quickly once it hits the surface. But um, I think it's yes, it's um, once it's no longer constrained on either side, it will naturally sort of um, sort of uh, shift outwards and uh, sort of spread. Yeah, and then probably over time. Uh, it will probably eventually become uh, eroded, maybe sub sublimation erosion may be part of that, and its, its topographic relief will become sort of more muted. Yeah. It might be good after if you have other questions. I see someone in the back has a question to just come down and ask him right here. So in the meantime, I want to present our thanks to you with uh -huh. <laughs> the objects that you've been talking about tonight on the inside of the thank you card. Mm -hmm. thank you just for this. And we appreciate your coming tonight and enjoyed it very, very much. Oh, thank you.